Um, the Midwest Mechanics Seminar Series is a preeminent lecture series on mechanics in the U.S. and among the most prestigious worldwide. It was established in 1957 as a way of bringing prominent speakers to Midwest schools, and it currently involves 10 of the most prominent Midwest universities, including UM, UIC, UIC Purdue, Notre Dame, Wisconsin, and others. Um, I'm thrilled to introduce today's speaker, Dan Henningsen. Dan Henningsen is a professor of fluid mechanics at the KTH Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm, Sweden. He's been there since 1999, and he also obtained his PhD there. Before that, he was an assistant professor at MIT and a senior researcher at the Aeronautical Research Institute of Sweden. He also currently holds an endowed professor chair at IDA in Brazil. Uh, Professor Henningsen has made contributions to the area of large-scale numerical simulations of laminar turbulent transition and its control, with particular focus on bypass transition and boundary layers under free stream turbulence, and more recently in the area of unsteady aer aerodynamic flows. He's also very well known for his earlier work on non-modal stability theory, and he's the co-author of a highly influential and highly cited textbook called Stability and Transition in Shear Flows. Professor Henningsen has been instrumental in creating a number of centers. You can see a few of them listed here, in particular as the founding director of the Linné Flow Center, the Swedish E-Research, E-Science Research Center, and the Swedish Aerospace Research Center. Perhaps Professor Henningsen is a recipient of the prestigious Humboldt Prize and uh, European Research Council Advanced Grant. He's also a fellow of the American Physical Society and Euromec, as well as a member of the Royal Swedish Academy of Engineering Sciences. So let's, uh, let's welcome Professor Henningsen. Yes. Okay, thank you very much uh, for this introduction. And I'm very happy to be here and this uh, being able to give a, a talk in this series. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is five days, five schools. You guys are the first. I'm a little bit jet lagged, but it should be okay. I hope, uh, and then I, I'll see how I hold up on Friday when I'm supposed to have a talk on the medicine, but anyway. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about large scale numerical experiments of unsteady aerodynamic flows and the role of laminar turbulent transition. And uh, I'm Dan Henningsen from the uh, affiliate with the centers uh, at KTH. Uh, so I just want to start, let's see. I uh, want to start with uh, acknowledging some of the uh, co-workers here. The main work is done uh, together. Let's see if I can see. The, can you see this one? Yeah. Uh, three students, Simon Karen, Prabal Negi, and uh, uh, Miguel Benitez, uh, who have been doing some of the some of the main work here. And uh, you probably know some of these researchers, which I have collaboration with, and they have been involved in, in partially in, in some of these things. And, and funding agencies have some funding agencies uh, and programs in Sweden. We have computer time from various Swedish sources. And then uh, I had one of these European uh, Research Council's advanced grants, which funded uh, a bit of this research as well. So large scale numerical uh, experiments or simulations, we can think about that a little bit as a virtual wind tunnel. And uh, we want to, and for many years, we've, we've been having the idea that we're going to get exascale computers, and it's more or less here now, 10 to the 18 uh, flops. So just, uh, you've seen these pictures many times, I'm sure here is the, uh, the uh, top 500. This is the, the dots there are the, the, the fastest computer in the world. And just to show you that we do have some computers in Sweden, these rounded dots are Swedish computers, we have, they're of course a little lower. The most recent one is called Dardell. It's about 10, uh, 20 petaflops. Uh, I'm mentioning another computer, which is in Finland. It's a, a consortium of, of European uh, countries, uh, uh, Lumi, and this is actually the third uh, on the top 500 list right now. And we were able to run on that one. And I'll, I'll mention that because I'll show a, a scaling picture from that one. Um, so you can see that, well, the, the, the Swedish computers are a little bit lower, but we're coming up with some of the European computers similar to, to the, the very best ones. And of course, we have extra scale already. It's not uh, after all these years, we have one, and it's, of course, in the US, and it's the frontier, and it's slightly more than an extra scale, and it's in the top, five, top one of the top 500 is right now. And uh, it's in, in Oak Ridge. So, so, we, so I guess we will all 
here who are computational people in, in some near future be able to run on these exascale computers. So, so then it's a little bit of a, what can you do? And can you, can you reach this kind of numerical or virtual wind tunnel that people have been talking about for 30, 40 years? And I think in this, I, I will argue that we are getting to the point where you can, where you can uh, do that. So, um, uh, so we're, we're going to use direct numerical simulations as a virtual wind tunnel to assess complex aerodynamic flows. And the simulations is uh, DNS then capturing all the turbulence scales and they're complemented by what we call coarse grain DNS or, or uh, LES by filtering the highest wave numbers uh, or, uh, in, our, in our spectral element codes. Uh, so they're not the real LES, that's why, because we, they, they don't have subgrid scale modeling. So when they're just filtering the highest wave number and it's, it, we could think about it as coarse grained uh, DNS. And with the moving pitching motion that I'm going to talk about, we use uh, uh, arbitrary Lagrangian Olier and the LAE uh, method. And, and the codes that we use, I think many of you are familiar with the codes. <clears throat> we have the open source NEC 5000, uh, originally developed by, by Paul Fisher at Argonne. Now, of course, he's, he's in Illinois. Um, and um, it's a higher order spectral element method. And the reason why we teamed up, teamed up with him more than a decade ago is that uh, that code, even at that point, he, he was saying 20, 10, 15 years ago, I do nothing in the code that cannot scale to a million cores. And this is really true. So this has been really uh, nice. But where uh, we'd had to work on is to be able to get codes working on GPUs. It's more difficult. And now that we have a cousin of Neko, let's call it, uh, of NEC 5000 called Neko, it's uh, built on the same numerical methods, but it's completely rewritten by some people at KTH. And Niklas Jansson is a computer scientist. And there were some students working in our environment who was working. <clears throat> and that uh, code actually now scales uh, on the whole uh, Lumi machine, that's the one which was the third. Uh, and uh, so here's the scaling. So it's a linear scaling all the way up to 16,000 GPU. So this is uh, uh, really nice. And in fact, it's the first nomination in Sweden ever for the Gordon Bell Prize. So it's a finalist of the Gordon Bell Prize. <clears throat> and in that ca calculation, they're, they're exploring the ultimate regime of uh, turbulent rain at Bernard convection. I heard that another finalist is from Michigan. <laughs> Here, someone told me, I forgot uh, which code it is. Uh, but there's a finalist in the Gordon Bell Prize this year from Michigan as well. So, okay. Uh, then I want to show you what kind of, how we started out these things. Uh, it's, uh, uh, this is going to be a DNS show, uh, of, of a flow around the NACA 4412 at around number 400,000. And this is a real DNS. And uh, so the 4412 is kind of like a profile for a gliders. Of course, the 400,000 would be a very small glider. <clears throat> but uh, so we took like one of these profiles uh, out of the wing with a 10% cord. And that was the, our first attempt. And this, this was uh, done in 2015 about. So we have about 3.2 billion grid points here. And you can see a little bit about the grid here, maybe not so well, but the grid is coming out there. And we extended the grid for some reason, maybe a little bit too long, but we extended it quite far uh, behind, the air, uh, behind the airfoil, as you can see soon here. And uh, <clears throat> then of course we need the boundary condition. We had Dirichlet boundary condition coming from RAND solutions and then stress-free outflow and uh, 35 million core hours and about 75 terabytes of data. And this was quite big, 2015. It's still not so small. And then we start, this is the Lambda 2 criterion. Here we see all the turbulent structures and they start exactly at the line because we have tripping of the flow there to turbulence, some using random forcing. And, and then you can see all the turbulent structures coming off. The red signifies fast velocities, green, yellow, a little bit slower and you'll see some blue area soon and that's where the stream wise velocity is more or less zero so this kind of uh, more or less separated flow but you can see all these structures in turbulence and then you, you have, i'm sure you've seen these things uh, many times nowadays so we have some incipient uh, separation here and then we have a formation of a mixing layer and if we look very far back, uh, we more or less see the formation of 
some type of Carmen-like uh, vortex street coming up there. So uh, how does how does it look then for this type of aeronautical applications? So uh, at that time, then we could do DNS of Reynolds number 400,000, took 35 million core hours. Uh, and that was about three months, the 16,000 cores. And then it took the queuing time about the same. So this was a computation of, of six months. So, but six months is, is not bad. I mean, you do an experiment in the wind tunnel, of course you, you can do many experiments, but to set things up and so on. But uh, we found that six months is, if you want to do really large scale cal calculation, it takes about six months. I don't know if, if you have other uh, experiences. So then if we do the coarse grained DNS, if we do the filtering, we can, with essentially the same accuracy, reduce the number of grid points by half in each direction. And that means that we have a 10% of the, of the computation. So that means that we can do, that we could at that time, for the same six months computation, uh, do a million, about a million Reynolds number. And, and we also have some <coughs> simulations uh, together with Philip Schlatter and, uh, and so on uh, of a million uh, Reynolds number. And then we're getting up to maybe what could be at least the lower end of typical university wind tunnel experiments uh, in, in, in uh, uh, in the wind, wind tunnels. And then now, since that time, the computers are about 10 times faster. So now we, we can, for the same effort, to go about uh, 2 million. And if we, you know, and if, if that's the computer, this was the computer that we had at KTH. If we go to this Lumi computer, we probably can do 4 million. So we're, we're, go, we're getting up to, with the largest computers, to doing a number of millions in Reynolds number. And that's kind of what people usually do in, in, uh, in wind tunnels. So in this sense, we can, we can think of this as a vision of going in that direction. And so um, what can we do then? What type of uh, things do we want to study or what does allow us to study? Well, we have been doing some stuff, active flow control and wings with plasma actuators. We've been doing transition to turbulence and turb turbine machinery cascades with runners numbers around 500,000 and so on. And then what I'm going to talk about today, we're starting to do uh, well, over the few, last few years, pitching wings and looking at the Fed effect of unsteadiness on transition and separation. What I'm going to talk about today is not millions of runners numbers, it's a hundreds of thousands, but the aim is to go up to millions. And I will talk about more more uh, typical, uh, uh, not, not, not the really high Reynolds number. And then another thing which uh, uh, we're thinking about in the future is uh, to look at uh, uh, the, uh, uh, oscillating dynamic stall and coupling it with air elasticity and so on so that we, we get into to this, this kind of unsteady applications. So essentially, all of these things are unsteady uh, application. And there's a number of them, flapping wings, rotating blades, blades from helicopter, wind turbines, and so on, <clears throat> and, these, and oscillating wings, and dynamic stall. And, and all of these uh, things can be designated non-autonomous flows in the sense that you cannot, there's an inherent time dependence in there. You cannot take a time average and think that that will converge into something useful because things will change in time inherently. Uh, and the uh, non-autonomous flows that we're going to look at is oscillating wings and dynamic stall. Uh, the one, the two, two uh, examples to the right there. So I'm going to show you just a couple of, of, of uh, uh, movies of the oscillating wings and of the dynamic stall just to show the type of things that we can do, uh, not at the highest Reynolds number, but at the Reynolds number where we now are going to do some analysis. And then I go back to the analysis of, uh, of, of these flows and then uh, apply the methods to, to these flows. So uh, this is the oscillating pitching wing. So the wing looks steady, but you can think of, uh, this a small change of angle of attack kind of signifying by, by these arrows. So, so it's going back and forth. And when it and it's 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 a, not a too high Reynolds number, hundred thousand, but you can see <clears throat> that you have drastic changes in the transition uh, and and separation in this flow. So part of the uh, time it's completely laminar, and and it, it's only a degree or two in 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 angle of attack changes, and and then uh, as it pitches up uh, after a while, 
we have uh, the whole flow being uh, of the wing being turbulent. So we're going to try to understand a little bit about this flow. Can we understand why some of these things are happening? And can we do some stability analysis on such a complicated flow? That's one thing we're going to try. The other uh, one that we're going to look at is the dynamic stall. And it's an airflow pitching up beyond the stall angle. Then it's an abrupt large scale flow separation and then uh, a dynamic stall vortex. So this is a 200,000 Reynolds number. And you can see the angle of attack here, 9, 10, 11 degrees going up and the pressure coefficient see uh, the vortex becomes, uh, the uh, stall becomes, uh, the dynamic stall vortex uh, forms and in the beginning you have the separation bubble becomes larger and larger and then finally breaking off and then propagating down as a uh, dynamic stall vortex. So this is of course a very complicated flow. Can you get anything out of a flow like this? That, that's useful information. So this is uh, one ex another example. So, uh, the aim of these studies then is linear and nonlinear dynamics of non-autonomous flows, and can we understand instabilities and coherent structures? <clears throat> so first, I would start talking about a much simpler flow, and its stability of pulsating for a flow, because there we want to try to understand the instability of of a, of a flow that has an inherent uh, 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 unsteadiness. And then we're going to apply some of these ideas that we find uh, to the linear stability of a pitching airfoil, the, the first simulation I showed, and look at both absolute and global instabilities of that flow. And then we're going to look at the onset of dynamic stall and try to extract some coherent structure out of those uh, simulations. So uh, we start looking at the linear and nonlinear dynamics for non-autonomous flows. We start, uh, we're dealing with incompressible uh, <coughs> Navier-Stokes equations but we then have some type of inherent time dependence through a uh, uh, volume forcing or through time dependent boundary conditions or something like that. So then means that we solve the Navier-Stokes equation which where the Navier-Stokes operator, so to speak, has a time dependence. And then of course we get a base flow or a, or a time average flow or whatever uh, that uh, is time dependent. Uh, and then if we want to look at disturbances around that, perturbations, uh, we can derive the linearized Navier-Stokes equation. It looks the same, but the UB then is time dependent. And so if we think about this a linear operator, uh, then that linear operator is time dependent. So we have a linearized equation and I'm going to look, look, at, uh, look at this equation a lot. So just remember where it comes from. So we're solving a linear, uh, 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 equation where the the linear operator is time dependent, and then we 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 cannot just do our regular uh, use use our regular methods. And then of course the, the perturbation becomes time dependent. So if you want to look at stability, for example, and you have a steady flow, <clears throat> then you have a normal mode ansatz, and then you derive an eigenvalue problem. So the normal mode ansatz is assuming that uh, you have a, let's say in this case e to the uh, uh, lambda t, and, and then taking the, uh, and then the lambda comes out as an eigenvalue and q is the eigenfunction and then the lambda, you can get the growth rates and frequencies from. So, and for example, if you heard of the Orsommerfeld equation, I think many people have, this is just a formal, formal uh, this is just a version of, of this. So I, I'd be looking at some of these uh, solutions. So th these are the typical ways of doing uh, fluid stability. Uh, and uh, if you have periodic, for example, flows, then you can take a Fourier transform and then you couple a bunch of frequencies. But once you take the Fourier transform of this uh, UB, <coughs> and, and uh, then you can do a normal mode ansatz and then you can derive an eigenvalue problem. And this is the Floquet problem. So although the Posse flow that I'm looking at is periodic, I'm not going to use this uh, method because I want to be able to use something that's also uh, can be done for arbitrary time dependence. So uh, for arbitrary time dependence, then of course we <coughs> are stuck with this uh, equation that we, we easily derive the linearized Navier-Stokes where the linear operator has a time dependence. So let's uh, look at the, the uh, stability of pulsating Poisson flow. 
So there we have uh, the regular Poisson profile. We add an oscillating Stokes layer, and together they form a nonlinear solution of the Navier Stokes. And these are the various uh, uh, profiles. So Poisson flow is, is then two walls. The flow is going from left to right. And, and instead of having just this parabolic profile, once you oscillate uh, uh, the flow rate, uh, then you get, uh, for a one period, the flow changes. Uh, so these are the profiles, instantaneous snapshot of the profiles over a period. So we're going to see are the efficient stability tools for this and how is the linear dynamics related to the local stability. And with the local stability, I mean doing an eigenvalue stability of these individual profiles. Can you see a relationship between that and, and the uh, linear dynamics of the full oscillating flow? So we're going to use... Uh, Poisson flow at Reynolds number 7,500. And uh, this is a typical spectrum uh, of uh, eigenvalue spectrum. And uh, for Reynolds number 7,500, we have one eigenvalue, which is slightly above zero here, me meaning that it has positive growth rates. All the eigen other eigenvalues are, are decaying. And this uh, red dot here, then this wave that that uh, signifies is usually called tolmer schlichting waves. This came up from the 40s, I guess, when they did this first time in, in, in channel flows and boundary layers. <clears throat> so we're going to see how does this, how does the stability diagram change? And uh, this is then on this side, this is the, the I, I told the eigenvalue lambda. So this is the uh, 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 y-axis here, so to speak, in the real, real part of lambda. This is the growth rate and the imaginary part of lambda. This is the frequency of the, of the oscillations. So if we then look at uh, solutions uh, to the linear Navier Stokes, we don't do any Floquet analysis now, although it could be done. But if we look at the solution to the linear Navier Stokes, so we, we solve this, uh, this linearized equations. Uh, over over the uh, uh, oscillating flow, then we can get flow. We can get things that are that are increasing or decreasing. These bullets are spaced one period apart. So so if we sample what is the solution after one period, then we can see that that uh, it can grow or it can decay. But a lot more is happening than just what's happening in in one period, which is what you would find from a Floquet analysis. So there are a lot of things happening in between, uh, and it's it's both growing and decaying when this when this channel flow. Uh, so these are disturbances in there, and there are and the disturbances are growing and decaying uh, during this process of oscillation. And I'm going to talk about this uh, case here. This is different. These are different uh, Wolseley numbers. That's actually a non-dimensional number proportional to the square root of the frequency. Uh, and I'm going to talk about uh, this one here that's slightly decaying, but you can see that it has both quite a bit of growth and decay over a period. And so if we pick out one period here, and it's a Wolseley number 18 and 16% uh, 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 mass flow rate uh, compared to then the... the the, the flow rate would be one in this case, and the mass flow rate is then, the, the, the time dependent mass flow rate is 16%. So I'm going to take a look at this to try to see, to understand. I mean, because it looks a little bit strange, we're inputting a simple sinusoidal uh, forcing, but we're getting out some little strange kinks and stuff here. So what, what is going on? And maybe we can understand something. So if we look at, instead of the, uh, uh, the energy, if we take a look at the growth rate of that solution, that linearized Navier Stokes. So then, then the growth rate is uh, the local growth rate, meaning essentially the, the, the derivative of the time dependence, right? So, so then it's positive, it's increasing for a while, then it's, then, uh, then it's decreasing here, but in an oscillatory manner, and then it goes back on a period, it's the same as over here. So this is a solution to the linearized Navier Stokes. You enter some initial condition and you run to get a, uh, uh, let's say, a, a, a uh, it's not a steady state, but but uh, uh, get rid of the transients <clears throat> to the oscillating state, and that's that's how it uh, how it looks like. 
So this is a solution to the linearized Navier-Stokes. And we're going to look at this, uh, the local stability, how does that compare to the local uh, stability analysis of the snapshots? So of course, these local stability analysis of the snapshots, and these are the snapshots of the that I showed you before, uh, they're not the solution to the Navier-Stokes because they're, they're, they're assuming homogeneous, no, no time dependence. Uh, so it's not a solution to Navier-Stokes. Instead, or what is, we're just tracking the eigenvalues. Or what's going to happen to the eigenvalues as we change this, this, uh, 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 this oscillating Poisson flow? So uh, we track the local eigenvalues of the pulsating Poisson flow. <clears throat> and of course, if we have a periodic base flow, so this base flow is, you know, repeats itself after a period, the spectrum will also repeat itself after a period because it goes back to exactly the same problem you solved. So uh, here is the spectrum again that I showed you. Now we have zero uh, uh, amplitude of the oscillation. And if we then change to 10%, then the eigenvalue over that period, you track, you track the eigenvalue and it, changed, it changes like this. And you can look at the blue line there. So of course the, the eigenvalue is not exactly at the center, but uh, because none of the profiles are Poisson, but it, so sometimes it becomes more unstable and sometimes a little bit less unstable. And let's increase the flow rate and see what happens uh, to this uh, spectrum. Then it turns out that one of these uh, um, uh, 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 eigenvalue orbits touches another eigenvalue orbit, and then they, you get a subharmonic eigenvalue orbit. This is kind of interesting. So there's a periodic spectrum, but there's not a harmonic eigenvalue orbit. This is subharmonic. So I'll, I'll show you again here. You can take a look at the blue. It goes up to it touches one of the gray orbits, and then it becomes subharmonic. So there, and then you have a subharmonic orbit. And, uh, and this red dot where it touches, it's called an exceptional point. Uh, it's uh, a point where two eigenvalues are the same. It's a degenerate eigenvalue. I didn't actually know that it was called exception points. My graduate student pointed that out. We were all, always ca calling it degenerate, but it turns out there's a big literature about exceptional points uh, that he found. <clears throat> so, uh, so, so now uh, we have these eigenvalue orbits giving us growth rates over these orbits. And, and how can we understand that? But, so we're going to compare the, the eigenvalue orbits to the growth rates of the linear navier stokes So these were the growth rates from that solution that I showed you, oscillating Poisson flow. And how does it look then if we <clears throat> compare to, so I think this is slightly different uh, parameter value. So here then is, is one of these eigenvalue orbits. One eigenvalue starts here, you go uh, one period, then it doesn't come back, but it comes down to an eigenvalue that was originally here. But during that period, that eigenvalue went up here. Uh, so how does that look? Well, if we plot that, uh, we see that the eigenvalue up here, it starts here, and then over a period it goes down, but then it continues to go down. And then it's, it's over here where that eigenvalue is, which goes up and then it's up here. And now you can see in certain areas, these local eigenvalue orbits, growth rates there are very similar to the linearized solution. And in some cases, they're very different. And just to look a little bit at, uh, and, and, and here we kind of have a branch transition. You see that, that there's a, the branch that's most important to our, who are growing is kind of changing here. So there's several eigenvalues that somehow uh, are, have similar growth rates. So we kind of change different eigenvalue branches. So let's look at the eigenfunctions. If we take a look at the eigenfunctions of these two modes and the global linear perturbation. So this is a solution to the linear Navier Stokes. So it's like a wave with plus minus. And, and, uh, and then we have the two eigenfunctions. The Q0 is the one up here. Q1 is the one down here. And you see that this one, where the growth rate is similar, is almost identical to the, to the linearized global solution. Whereas the one down here, very damped, is completely different. Uh, then if we go to, to what, do the, what do the eigenfunctions look like uh, here in this, in this region where, the, where 
uh, one is not dominating, then we can see that neither of these eigenvalues, not neither here nor over there, are really the same as the linearized navier stokes Of course, it doesn't have to be because there's no reason why only one eigenvalue should dominate everywhere. Uh, but somehow you can imagine that actually what's happening here is some type of combination here. And if you look at these structures, and you're you're aware of some of the stability literature, this reminds us what the OR mechanism, if you heard, heard about that. OR mechanism is associated with transient growth with solutions that are have have uh, tilted shear layers that are that are moving in and out and uh, and uh, and creating transient growth. So there's some type of of, of a transient growth associated with, with possibilities associated with it. And then in the end, if you go back, of course, we have the same thing as we started with, but then now it's the, the other eigen mode, <clears throat> what we call the Q1, which is the one that looks the same as, as the uh, uh, as the linearized Navier-Stokes. So we can see that there are certain periods where single eigenvalues could tell us some of local eigenvalues that could tell us something about the flow and other periods where uh, we have other, other effects where we at least would have to have combination of modes and so on. So uh, what can we do? Steady, we know we can do eigenfunctions, arbitrary time dependence. Well, we're going to use something that <coughs> came up uh, rather recently, I would say, Babai and Subsys published the first papers in 2016, and it, uh, it's called optimal, op optimally time dependent modes. And it's a way of doing stability analysis around uh, um, uh, trajectories that vary in time. So I will very briefly introduce the concept here. I have a few more slides if someone wants to know, but I don't want to go into the nitty gritty detail. It, it's quite uh, some derivation that one has to look at. Uh, so <clears throat> the OTD modes are based on the solutions to the linearized equations. And here I write L with kind of like a regular capital L, it means a little bit that it's we have discretized it. And of course, we always discretize it in the end. Um, so what we do there is that we compute on our, uh, on our for normal basis QR, uh, spanning the dominant instabilities. And we compute that using the linearized equation. And in this way, we uh, optimally follow linearized uh, dynamics uh, in time. Uh, so what that allows us to do, so think about QR uh, is a matrix with where, where the, uh, the individual vectors are solutions to the linearized equations in such a way that these vectors are orthogonal. So, this, the, uh, so they're, they cannot be exact solutions to the linearized equations, but they're, they are actually solutions to for, uh, uh, forced linearized equations such that each vector is orthogonal to each other. So it spans a space. And if it spans a space, if we think about this, this, this linear operator here, uh, uh, this is very large if we want to discretize the operator itself. Usually we just discretize the action of L on U. But if we want to have the whole U, it's very expensive. It, it's like billion by, by a billion if you have a large you know, 3D problem. But if you if you can create such a a orthogonal basis, which actually takes into account the dominant, follow the optimal uh, linearized dynamics, then you can project the linear operator into reduced operator by uh, this, this matrix Q. And then you get something very cheap, right? Very small. If you take, you know, if these, these are huge vectors, but if you only have 10 of them, this will be a 10 by 10 matrix. So then, then you have an approximation of this linear system that you can start. Uh, looking at, and then uh, you can do eigenvalue pro eigenvalues of it, you know, uh, very simple, uh, very easily, and you can <coughs> relate these these uh, OTD modes, the QR vectors, to the eigenfunctions and so on, and you can start doing things with uh, with this reduced. You can look at the uh, maximum growth rate, for example, uh, uh, from uh, from this L, and it it may not, of course, reflect the whole truth because it's just a reduced order but you can start doing things with this uh, method, look at stability of, of, of things like that. So an, an, another way to look at this, so we have the OTD modes that spans the orthogonal subspace, and optimally following this linearized dynamics around the nonlinear trajectory in phase space. And you can imagine it like this, 
kind of you, you think here this is a trajectory in phase space so <clears throat> it's a solution each point here is a solution and it somehow evolves in space and at each just conceptually then at each point you have this orthogonal subspace i'm just drawing three but we could have many more of course this is uh so uh, and then and then they they are you keep them orthogonal the whole time so the space changes but the 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 vectors spanning the space are always orthogonal so uh, and to, to do this you you uh, a forced linear solution around the non trajectory solved on each OT, uh, for each otd mode so you solve a forced linear problem and the derivation that they did is they derived what type of forcing do you have to put on the linearized problem in order to to get these these vectors to be orthogonal because if you just took random vectors and you said oh, fine i'm going to follow them then of course they would just become parallel after a while because they would all focus on the most uh, unstable mode and, and then essentially point in the same direction so the otd modes remain orthogonal but random vectors uh, that you would solve various initial conditions of linear problems they would they would start converge to the most unstable mode so this is as much I'm going to say about this. And uh, it took me actually quite a long time to try to type of grasp this. So if you don't understand everything, that's fine. But hopefully you get the basic idea that it's possible to calculate this orthogonal subspace based on the linear solutions. So uh, let's see then. So this is this is uh, this is what it looks like. Uh, here we 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 started uh, with twelve. Uh, 12, 12 uh, vectors. I don't know if you can try to point it to 12 there. Yeah. Uh, and if we have 12 vectors, it turns out that you get six modes because you get a complex conjugate because you have a real solution. So these are all these modes uh, in time. So you start out with some, in, some guess for the initial condition. You have some transits in time. And then after a while, uh, <clears throat> these modes. So this is the growth rate of these modes. And they oscillate uh, back and forth during this oscillating Poisson flow. And the red thing here, that's that's the maximum growth rate, uh, maximum growth possible within this approximation of the linear system. So we can compare this first eigenvalue here, or O to D mode, growth rate of the O to D mode to the, uh, uh, to the uh, uh, orbits that we found. And you can see, well, it kind of goes around the first eigenvalue, but it's not exactly on top. But we only have six different vectors or 12 uh, if you do count the complex conjugates. So, well, does it converge? Well, if we take 120, then it, it makes it, it, it perfectly traces this subharmonic uh, eigenvalue orbit. So, so uh, we can see that the reduced operator converges as the OTD modes uh, increase. So, we have a way of of, of creating these local uh, uh, linear subspaces that actually is a cat, depending on how many modes you get and depending exactly what you want to, to do from them can give you a good idea of the local linear subspace. Of course, we're not really interested in having these things converge down here. They are super damped. And, and if we have something that's not converged down here, but it's fairly converged up here, maybe we, we can get a, a you know, good enough approximation of some type of instability. So this is what I'm going to say about the OTD modes. So it's a linear stability framework for arbitrary time-dependent flows found by optimally following the linearized dynamics. And a reduced linear operator can be found in the orthogonal subspace defined by the locally most unstable directions. And there's an efficient implementation for stability analysis where a linear system is solved for each uh, OTD mode. So after all that uh, long uh, discussion, let's try to see what happens. Can we use this on some more complicated flows? So this is, uh, we're going to look at linear stability of the pitching airfoil, the one that I showed you from the beginning, and both absolute and global instabilities. And again, here's the airfoil. We have the alpha shear around which it oscillates is 6.7 degrees. This comes from an experiment that was done at KTH uh, 2017, and my student who did calculations a couple of years later. And here, the uh, oscillation, uh, the amplitude of oscillation is 1.3 degrees. So it's not very, uh, not very large. And you, you saw the, the movie. So I'm not going to show the movie again, but I'll show snapshots of the movie. <clears throat> then you can see that how it goes from fully laminar to fully turbulent and then 
down to laminar again. Uh, and the, the an interesting thing here, which I'm not going to talk about either, is that there's actually hysteresis. You can see here that th this uh, angle of attack is about seven degrees. This angle of attack is about seven degrees. And one is fully laminar and one is fully turbulent. So there's a hysteresis here. And that's also an interesting thing. And, and we looked into that a little bit. Uh, but that's not the aim of, of, of this talk. So it's not where you have the maximum angle of attack that you have in maximum turbulence and the, and the, ma the, the minimum turbulence. It, there's, a, there's an hysteresis. And that's a little bit interesting in itself. But I'm rather going to talk about now a large upstream shift of transition. And I'll show a couple of other uh, figures about that. That here, when this has gone down a little bit, in angle of attack, it goes from essentially being laminar with a few waves that are being emitted from this, as it turns out, the separation bubble here, to drastically just starting turbulence, uh, uh, small scale turbulence, right at the end of the separation bubble. And it kind of goes quite quickly. So there's a lo large upstream shift over uh, a small part of the period uh, of the transition location. So if we look at that, where this upstream shift is, it associated with a large leading edge separation bubble. So here's the separation bubble. It's time average over a very short period so that uh, uh, we can kind of get a little smoother uh, curves, but still, still uh, it, it's a local, local phenomenon. So, so, so both here and as it appears, this, this large scale, uh, this, this small scale turbulence appears uh, right at the end of the separation bubble. And at that time, the bubble has about 30% backflow. So it's a, it's a sizable amount of backflow in the, in the separation bubble. So, okay, so we think that, well, okay, it has to be unstable somehow. Maybe the instability can, can predict it. So we look at the Orsonfeld solution, the same as we looked at for uh, the Poisson flow when I showed the spectrum. Uh, and we look at the profiles right at the maximum of the separation bubble. And uh, we have we have extracted a number of profile that we look look at stability from. I don't know. So here, so you can see that some of these profiles are we start with them when they're not separated; it's just nearly separated, and then they go up to about thirty percent, as what I showed you before. So, but it turns out that even if it's not separated, these all of these are highly unstable. So they're they're unstable for all local velocity profiles. So you cannot you really use that to determine exactly is there something specific happening there. So then we went to looking at can, can this have anything to do uh, with, the, um, uh, with, with the change from convective to absolute instability? Well, uh, the nature of the instability in terms of convective and absolute, it has to do with the impulse response. If you look at this XT diagram and you say, do you have some type of disturbance here? This is X, this is T. If it's convectively unstable, then uh, let's say you do an impulse response, you get a wave packet and everything propagates out. So the, both the rear part and the front of the wave packet propagates out. But if you have a, an absolute instability, then part of the disturbance stays. So it doesn't propagate out. And that usually signifies that you get more energy located right where you have the disturbance because it doesn't go away, it stays there. And then it's usually a sign that rapid transition may happen. So these uh, 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 absolute instabilities uh, and disturbance that doesn't change, it, it doesn't propagate down is associated with a zero group velocity, meaning the lambda decay, so the derivative of the free of the eigenvalue with the with the, with the um, uh, the uh, what do you call it a wave number <laughs> wave number I, I'm it's a jet lag it's a jet lag. Yeah, it's a wave number zero. So the lambda decay is equal to a saddle point in the complex K plane or a cusp in the complex lambda plane. And that's something that can be calculated. So uh, we did that based on that these profiles. And then we found it for this maximum, pretty much uh, at this maximum separation, we found that there is then uh, uh, an absolute instability that is located in this strong um, uh, circulation region. And um, well, how is this absolute unstable separation bubble related to the rapid upstream shift? Well, that we don't really know, but we're now going to at least hope to get a little bit 
uh, more information from these OTD modes. You know, spending all the time understanding them, we want to apply apply to something. So the, we're going to use the OTD modes to find the global linear instability of the pitching airfoil that is related to, hopefully, that is related to this absolute instability. So then we do this. We start out with the base flow, uh, and which I showed before. And, and this is, you can use kind of use this as a base flow here because it's mainly, although there's some disturbances over here, in this whole region, it's essentially laminar. And, and then in order to do the OTD modes, uh, we uh, choose a, a domain, which is a little bit smaller here. And we solve the linearized Navier-Stokes equations in this red region. And in the end of the region, we put in a little bit of forcing here, like a fringe. You can see a little bit gray region here <clears throat> so that we can shorten the region so that disturbance, linear disturbances can propagate out. Uh, we can adapt before they probably get out so they don't destroy uh, uh, the solution. So we solve here 16 linear problems in this region uh, uh, while we solve this base flow uh, in time. And then we're going to take a look at, at these modes and see what they look like. So here is the local flow field, so essentially the base flow around which we fault, and then we uh, had the, have the shear stress, which I'm uh, going to uh, show you a little bit later as well. So here is the chord, and here is time, and as time increases, and this is contours of zero shear stress, <laughs> it's actually span-wise average stream-wise shear stress. So here, when uh, if, if this is shear contour, this is where we have a separation bubble right here, and this line signifies where. Uh, Prabal found this uh, uh, absolute instability at, at this point in time. So well into the separated area. And here is like the separation bubble right here. So now we're going to look at the OTD modes, but then I will show them associated with this picture here, but I will turn it 90 degrees. So we'll take a look like this. So here again, we have the stream, the contours of the zero contour of the stream by shear stress. This is now time here. And this is space. So it goes from essentially the leading edge up to 40% chord. And then once we get to this time here, then we have a separation bubble. And this dashed line is where we have this absolute uh, instability in the, in the uh, previous calculation. So if we then take a look at these OTD modes, or it's, it's the leading OTD mode, uh, the most unstable, so to speak. So, well, here are all these these modes, and and the, the red one again are the 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 uh, the maximum growth rate, and then these other modes here. Um, they are slightly unstable here, and if we look at one uh, the upstream of the or, or before the the separation bubble, you can see some kind of waves reminiscent uh, of waves there, and here, some type of wave packet, maybe if you take a look at contours at, at the edge there, but not much is happening. If we then go inside the separation bubble, then we see that we have a lot. And re remember, this is a solution to the linearized problem now. So then, then based on this uh, uh, separate, separated profiles here, we get uh, like large uh, wave packets propagating out of the separation bubble. And, and from the linear solution, and this is the leading leading uh, mode. And uh, so that's kind of what you expect, but what happens then if we go to to uh, a time where we have the absolute, where we found the absolute instability? Well, then we actually get something different. So we still have some waves, but now we're also in, the, in a region where right after the separation bubble, the flow starts to become turbulent. So after the separation bubble, if you want to do linear stability of a turbulent flow, it doesn't really make sense, right? So, but here, the separation bubble is more or less laminar. Then we can see that we have a large scale instability now on the separation bubble that has uh, uh, a, a slight change in the streamwise direction and, and one, one period of the, of the, of, of the spanwise flow. So, so this is, and, and th there have been others uh, who have been looking at these types of of uh, flows, Daniel Rodriguez, for example, and so on. They have looked at and found instabilities, global instabilities of separation bubbles that have kind of this shape. 
so so somehow um, uh, we found a a global version of this local absolute instability and and of course well does it help us for the onset uh, of these small scales I'm, I'm not sure because what what could it be well it could be like a secondary instability of this in any case there is a uh, uh, as you can see here, there's a fairly strong uh, growth rate here of, of, of modes right in the area where you see this. So there's something uh, growing fairly strongly with this, with this type of shape and that we could find uh, from these OTD uh, modes. So what we found on absolute instability in the leading edge separation bubble, we found the leading OTD mode that showed this 3D structure associated then with the global counterpart of that instability. Of course, thinking about the rapid upstream shift of the transition location, which was associated with the breakdown at the rear part of the bubble. Well, our, our, our current guess is that it's likely caused by some type of secondary instability on these things. But that of course, it's, it's, we, have not, we cannot say that we have, have found. So the last thing is the dynamic stall. So uh, we're going to uh, take a, uh, try to extract some coherent structures out of, of, out of this dynamic stall simulation. Again, this is the uh, stream-wise shear stress. This is the chord of this, of this uh, 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 wing. Yeah. And, and here is time. And blue is reverse flow and uh, red is uh, forward flow. So you can see here we have some in the beginning when we have about eight degrees angle of attack. We have a leading edge separation bubble and that's what we can see here. Uh, and then as we move on, this bubble becomes larger and then it starts propagating out. And this is then associated with this large dynamic uh, stall vortex that's uh, coming off. So here is one snapshot of the, this is from the simulation I showed you before earlier. And then you have the, the large scale separation bubble here. Uh, and then uh, it, it kind of goes into a dynamic stall vortex further on. But we're going to take a look at this when it starts. And one of the things that we were interested in <clears throat> is to, to, to look at the effect of the amplitude of disturbances that comes in. Because look, I mean, this is a really large, high amplitude uh, flow case, a really turbulent. Uh, but uh, we have a very small initial turbulence here, 0.02 percent. You know, a, a lot, par with the very best wind tunnels in the world. If we just increase this a little bit to 0.05 percent, we can see that these large scales are actually being modulated by something else that's propagating. So again, the x here and the time, and we can see that there are some some modulation of this rather smooth curve for the original simulation. And, uh, and, and this uh, associated here with the zero shear stress. And as we have these kinks, there's some stuff that's propagating uh, out uh, in time. So we want to try to find these structures to, to, to see these, what are those modulations? So we're going to do uh, proper, th pro proper orthogonal decomposition. So being that we have a bunch of snapshots, we put them in a matrix, we do the correlation of, that matrix and we have some type of weighting function that can uh, tell us if we want to have the energy or stuff like that. But instead of having the regular POD, we're going to have what we call a space-time POD. So each snapshot is now going to be a solution to the full problem. So we start uh, with, with, uh, with some uh, initial condition and then we integrate forward and we see this. And then we start with a, a slight variation in <clears throat> this incoming free stream turbulence, this very low amplitude incoming free stream turbulence, and then we get another, uh, another snapshots. And so uh, each realization, each snapshot is a full resolved solution in time. So we look at uh, five, 25, this is kind of like a first shot at this. We look at five, 25 realizations of this in incipient <clears throat> dynamic stall and we do the full calculations but then we pick out the solution in an area like this where we perform the pod from in the front of the wing and here are 25 
shear stress con uh, contours of, of these realizations. Blue again, backflow, red, uh, positive shear stress. And again, this is the streamwise direction of, of the cord, and this is the, the uh, uh, time. So this is all based on wall data of the shear stress. And we just varied the initial condition a little bit, not very much, but you can see that the realization is actually not, is, is, is changing. So uh, we take the, the contour, and but we choose the weighting function <clears throat> here to actually concentrate on the structures, because that's what we now decided we thought would be interesting. And then uh, we do the eigenvalues, and then the largest eigenvalue then of course picks out these structures. That's how we kind of chose it. But now that we have these uh, uh, structures, we can extend those PUD because each shear, each uh, wall shear uh, um, snapshot is associated with a full, full flow field. So, so we can get that uh, kind of extended PUD to, so we can get the full flow field uh, all, from the structures that had this shear stress uh, uh, contours. So if we then look at this, uh, then we see in time, then it would come into this area. And then we see large scale structures that we <coughs> found uh, propagating downstream associated with these shear layer uh, structures. So this is the time dependence of time dependence of the first PUD mode. This whole time dependent solution that we see uh, is one mode. Uh, so that's kind of the time dependence is in the mode. And then, of course, we can extract information out of this quantitative characteristics of the structures, the wavelengths, propagation speeds, uh, whatever. Over here to the right is the, the energy of these structures in, in time and so on, like that. So this is a tool we think could be useful. And... Uh, so the space-time PUD gives modes which captures time dependence of coherent structures in the non-autonomous flow. The extended PUD can focus on a specific region and find full flow field structures from modes calculated by wall information. And for small free stream turbulence, it gives rise to large scale vortices modulating the formation of the dynamic stalled vortex. So with this, I'm more or less finished. Uh, we looked at linear, nonlinear dynamics of non-autonomous flows. We had branch transition and non-normal effects from local stability analysis that gives insight into linear stability of non-autonomous flows that we found from this simple one, simple oscillated Poisson flow. The OTD framework allows for global linear stability analysis flows with arbitrary time dependence. The space-time PUD is a robust objective tool for coherent structure extraction in non-autonomous flows. And what I started talking about, the virtual wind tunnel vision allows now for more detailed investigations of complex non-autonomous flows at runners numbers typical of university wind tunnel uh, tunnels. This is more a vision right now. What I showed you here was a little bit lower runners number. Just as the very last thing, I will show you one uh, we also did some analysis of these oscillating pitching wings at high Reynolds number. This is 750,000, and which I think that's that's also published. Uh, and you can see immediately the difference. The difference is that the turbulent structures are much smaller. That's why you need all the resolution. So yeah, so this is in the direction that we want to go. Thank you very much. It's right there. Are we time for some questions? So in most of these cases, I know that uh, low frequency, large scale, deterministic motion, and then I'm assuming the stability motion are higher frequency. Is there a good, how different do they need to be for this to work? Well, you know, for the for the OTD modes, they don't need to be different at all. I mean, I mean, the the it turned out when we when we started working with the people doing the experiment of the pitching wing, that uh, uh, what they thought was high frequencies for us they were really low frequencies <laughs> so so if they have some some uh, aerodynamic effects or wings moving uh, in terms of fluids fluid turbulent structures they are very low frequency so so there was an inherent separation because of this but it, it's not necessarily for the OTD modes yeah 
Yeah, yeah. The thing with the, I don't know if you're referring to the OTD modes, but they are not, a, that's not a restriction on, it's not, it's not dependent on the scale separation. Of course, maybe it could mean that, that it's less likely that the single mode can describe something because maybe there's, it changes too fast. So a single local mode cannot describe something. But then, then, then again, you don't need to do the sing, look at the single local mode. If you have the li reduced linear operator, you can look at whatever you want. You can look at uh, resolvents, for example, right? You can look at whatever you want because you have an approximation of the linear operator. And maybe the eigenvalues of that operator may be not the most important thing. Yeah. Oh yeah, right. And I don't know why this was. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know that they traditionally they'd be called the AP and S branch from being presented at APS meeting in like 50, 60 years ago uh, by Mac. I think who did this originally. Uh, yeah. So so these. I, I don't know why that only. Maybe one can look at the eigenmode structure and understand why it only moves certain. I I don't. When you mention at the beginning of the different experience you have of the simulation of this virtual wind tunnel and then the variation with uh, with Reynolds, so <clears throat> assuming that six months of uh, calculation is like an experimental test in a wind tunnel, how how much of in terms of time of data you you're able to collect for six months when well, it's interesting that you ask that, and I, I have a, I have one, I, one example of that, not from a flow that I, that I actually have, have another. I, I just took some other flows that related work that we done, and one of the things that we have done is, is quite a bit of transition on, on a, on a flat plate under free stream turbulence, and this is from a, this is directly modeled from an experiment at KTH with the same leading edge and, and everything, turbulence levels and so on, and the same width of their plate and, and everything. So, so we, we calculated for, this is one of the largest calculations we've done. We calculated for six months, not at, in Sweden, but at some other HPC computer. And, and then we were going to look at the uh, integral length scale. And, and we didn't really get it to, to converge. And then we talked to the, the, the wind tunnel people and says, yeah, uh, we typically uh, put the probe there and then we sample it for 90 seconds. And then we, and then how long we were thinking, well, how long, how many, how many real seconds have we done now with this super high? Well, it turned out that we have done about five seconds, you know, so, so, the, so, so okay, of course, okay. So then what, what do we have to do? Well, we have a bunch of points. They had one point. So we have, if we took, you know, a lot of data from points nearby, but not, enough to be influenced each other, then we could get those 90 seconds, right? Because we, we had a, we could take hundreds of points and, and average them over, and then we could get that integral length scale. So, so yes, yeah, so we were a little bit disappointed that this, uh, so, I mean, the experiments and the simulations are, you know, good for different things and, and you should do both and you, you should, uh, you know, combine, combine the knowledge into something more than just maybe one. And so, yeah. That as a post processing of piece, you can get it flux and things like that between the within the boundary layer to yeah. The, if we not now so far we haven't included temperature, but we can do that. If yeah, does that cost you much more? Not so much more. It's one more scalar equation, so it's not so much more. But that's really yeah. Mm. Don't have to yeah. Layer, then mm. one more thing. Can get the feedback with the substrate, so the wall temperature, so the conjugate problem at the end of the day. I don't know if that is. Um, I think it, it should be. I don't think that should be so difficult. But well, yeah, I mean, we actually have done that, and, and in NEC 5000, people have done that. Yeah, so you can, you can do the conjugate heat. Yeah, so that you have the heat. Uh, uh, there's a module in NEC 5000 actually which solves the, the solid temperature. Yeah, so you can do that. And we did that for some topology optimization. We used that model, yeah, for heat, heat sinks to optimize heat sinks. Yeah. Sorry? 
uh, I linearized around the full nonlinear solution. And I, but we, we, what was actually only useful is where before it became turbulent. That's why we concentrated the OTD modes uh, on the region before it became turbulent. And the last OTD mode, I actually had another OTD mode with that, which I didn't show. You could, of course, follow it further, but they become totally meaningless when the flow is turbulent and you try to do, you know, a linear eigen mode around turbulent flow. At least I don't know what it means. Maybe. <laughs> we do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Use that for because it's competition challenge to perform. I get out of that position, or can you do the same like the same concept for a setting mode, or just something that will work as arbitrary? Well, I mean, I mean, it it works for arbitrary time dependence. I mean, what what we could since since as you pointed out, somebody else pointed out that that this pitching is not so fast. We could have taken a solution and, 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 and tried to do a linear global stability calculation, but that actually would not have been so much simpler. And, and then we would not have taken into account the time dependence. Not that I think maybe that's what's so, so important here because the time dependence was, uh, was fairly slow. So uh, it's, you know, but you would have to take, in a, you know, take that flow field, linearize around it and with some global stability. And then you should probably have been able to find in this case, something fairly similar, but 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 this method you don't with this method you solve the linearized equations and you don't have to. It's a little bit complicated to do global stability with separation bubble in three with a three D. So in this case, this is this is I don't think this is so much more complicated once we have the derived the once we have implemented this OTD framework. It's not so more. I, I think it's probably even less time consuming to get that solution than to do a full uh, global stability, at least not so much difference. All right, that's a good place to start. Yeah. So thanks again. Thanks.